it's good to have you with us, especially a few special people. I have a couple of things I want to say this morning. One, um, some people, there's all kinds of confusions about the mask now. So I've asked people, ask, well, what's the deal at church? This is what we've been talking to the deacons. We've decided at church, basically what I think is going on in most other places. If you are fully vaccinated, you do not have to wear them. It, but if you would like to, you feel protect you, protect others, you're welcome to do so. If you haven't been, you're encouraged to. Um, and um, I'm just going to leave it at that. If you have any questions, you can let me know. But um, I think we've been doing this long enough. We can kind of work together and figure it out with each other. Um, today, I don't even have time right now. I can't stand here and tell you everything that's going to go on today <laughs> because there's so much happening. But I just want to put it this way. Whether you're on Facebook whether you're here in the congregation, you are not a spectator today. There is so much going on. But one thing, we're never a spectator in worship. God is a spectator. We are the participants. And we're giving to God. But today especially, there's going to be so many ways that God's going to be inviting you to participate in what this worship time is about. I don't want you to miss it. So just be aware of that. As we go into this, as I lead us in a word of prayer, Realize that today we didn't come just to sit back and relax. We came to hear what God has to say, to be part of responding and ever how he would lead, and allow God's spirit to move within us. So I just thank you for that. Would you stand with me as I lead us in prayer? Lord, this is such a great, wonderful day. Lord, it's great for so many reasons. One is Dave Miller is back with us, oh God, and we just thank you for the healing that you provided in him for the recognition of the, the, the struggle that he was having that happened just when he showed up to a Bible study. And from that, it carried on to, to it was able to be taken care of. And Lord, it's been, it's been slower than Dave would like for it to be, but we thank you for that healing. We thank you that he made progress of being back here today, and we celebrate that. And Lord, that's just the beginning of celebrating who you are and what you do in our lives, in all of our lives. Lord, we thank you for the graduates that are here today that we'll be recognizing momentarily. And we just ask that you would bless them and their families in a very special way. And then for Joseph and Van, who are going to be coming, touch their hearts. Use your spirit in the way that you desire to reach out to not only each one of us, but then us continually to others and grow your kingdom as you see fit. God, we give ourselves and this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Continue standing as we sing together. Join with us as we sing here I am for worship.
First of all, I want to commend each of you for the accomplishment, not just the accomplishment of graduation, but the accomplishments that you have achieved throughout the years of life that you have. Beyond that, in your connection to Woodland, I want to thank you. And I could stand here and, and talk about each one of you and the relationship that I've had with you and the ways you contributed to Woodland, but I don't think I need to because I think many of the ones out here already know that. But I also hope that in the midst of that, we've been able to contribute to you in such a way that as you take your next step in your journey, the different directions you're going to be going, that you will take a part of Woodland with you. There will be things that God has allowed us to share with you that enable you to be more the person God desires you to be, and that's that prayer today. Um, we have gifts to give you, and I'm going to, we have Bibles, and I want to start with the ladies. And these Bibles, a lot of times when you get Bibles as a graduation gift, they can be a token gift particularly from a church. It's just a recognition. I want you to know that for Woodland, we're not doing that. These Bibles are very nice Bibles. They're study Bibles. And they're given to you not with the idea that you take this and remember that you belong to a church that cared for you as much as that's true. There is an immense gift in this scripture. And we pray that this will be a Bible that you will cherish for a long time and that God will use to lead and guide you and direct you in the way that you're going. With that being said, the first Bible goes to Elsie Juliet Bowden.
Good morning again. Good morning. If you would like to follow along in your Bibles, the scripture today comes from Isaiah chapter 40, beginning with verse 25. young man 
gave me hope unlike I've had in a very long time. What little bit I got was, I don't know that it was as much what he said as it was how he conducted himself. So this young man who was a junior provided hope for some grown adult that was a parent of someone on an opposing team. And even in the friendly competitive sports that we have, I don't know that we really think of ourselves as being able to do that for each other, with each other in today's world, but we do and we should. So young people, I want you to know you can be agents of hope, a source of hope for those who need it. Graduates, I know that the world can be putting on you right now. You can have a tendency to be saying, now that I've got this diploma, now that I've got a plan for where I'm going to go, I'm going to go and I'm going to see what I can get. I want to discourage you from having that perspective as you pursue life. You see, Scripture says in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And so I want to challenge you graduates today to look back over your years and consider what it is you have been given. What you have been given by teachers, by administrators, by parents, by God. And now, as you take a step out, at least to some degree, to greater independence, you get to make choices. And yes, you could make the choice to be grabbing the whole way along and just seeing how much you could get and how much you could accumulate. But I tell you, I promise you, if that is how you live your life, when your life comes to the end, you will be disappointed. Because God did not create us to be about seeing how much we can grab and get out of this life. The world will tell you that time. But God doesn't, and Scripture doesn't. And not only that, but Scripture tells us that we will be blessed. We will be more blessed when we give. How can that possibly work when we receive? We feel pretty blessed. We've got something that makes us feel good. We're appreciated. How can we be more blessed when we give? I tell you, it's because when we give out of what we already have, and we make a difference in someone else's life, the way God has designated prepared, created the kingdom, I promise you it becomes a blessing to you and it enables you to grow in a way that you can't grow any other way. And even though you're giving, you will receive. But not only that, you will see others receiving as well. It is how God desires us to embrace life. So I encourage you to keep that in mind as we go forward. So, I talked about where to be hope. We can't really be hope unless we have hope. So how do we find true and lasting hope? Graduates, remember I gave you those Bibles and I told you that they're valuable. They have a gift inside of them. I'm going to throw out several scriptures today. It may be that you have time and you want to look them up. If you choose to do that, that's great. If not, hopefully you can find a pen or pencil or something in your bulletin. There's an outline there. I encourage you to make notes of these scriptures because these scriptures are what give today's message much more so than me. And the first scripture comes from Hebrews chapter 6, verses 18 and 19, and this is what it says. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. So we're talking about God. That is where we receive our hope. And so the first thing I want you to know is that we find our hope in a personal God. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, it may sound pretty confusing, or initially confusing, we who have fled. 
So what does it talk about us fleeing from? What is that about? Now, obviously, you can think back to, to the time that the Israelites fled from Egypt, and there can be some connection there. But there is some relevance here to us. Because you see, God knows our past. God knows our present, and God knows our future. If anybody here who's never made a mistake, raise your hand. Good. There's no lie right here right now. Or oh, potentially, did your hand go up? Chris is done. But uh, what I want to do is to let you know that God knows everything. And there's my guess is, in those mistakes, most, if not all of us, also have regrets. There are things we wish we could take back, whether it's words, whether it's actions, whatever it may be. And so, in the midst of that, there's sin. And so, what do we flee from? We flee from the sin. And so, as we flee from sin, we're fleeing to refuge. And that's what this scripture is talking about. So, we who have fled take hold of hope. So, as you're running away, as you're getting away from that sin, you can't escape it by yourself. But you can through Jesus Christ, who loved us so much with that crazy love that he died on the cross. He was buried. He rose again. He conquered death. He conquered sin. And because of that, we don't have to bow to it anymore. That's what we did in fleeing from sin. So that's why when it says we flee from it, we now have hope set before us that we may be encouraged. We have a personal God who knows everything you've ever done. Now, there's some stuff here you don't need to air your dirty laundry. We aren't about doing that. Now, there's times we need to confess, and the Bible says there's times we need to confess each other, but the purpose of that is so that we may be able to move in the direction God desires. But I tell you, this God knows each and everything we've ever done, good and bad. And so you don't have to try to hide it. You don't have to try to pretend it. You know what? God already knows it, and He loves you as much as He loves anybody else on the face of this earth. That's pretty awesome. And so we need to acknowledge that, and we need to know that, and we know that that's the beginning of understanding hope. We have a personal God, even if you haven't reached that relationship yet, even if you haven't tried to grasp onto that, God's already reached out to you. He's personal. God knows everything about you. But God also provides refuge, protection, comfort, strength, and hope. And that's the beginning of it. God cares for you. There's times that every one of us has felt like there's nobody in the world that really cares about us right now. There's nobody about me. There's nobody that knows really what I'm going through. Life just stinks right now. But I tell you, God cares. And you're never alone. And Scripture says that over and over and over. So we're able to find hope in a personal God. Now the second thing is we're able to find hope in a powerful God. You know, I told you about how that sin got taken away because Jesus Christ died on the cross. He was buried and rose again. How much power did it take for Jesus to be risen again? It's the power of God. It's the power of the universe. It's the power that is greater and more powerful than anything else that's ever existed. And you know what? Through God, through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, we have access to that same power. Does that not give us hope? But we have that type of power. So we have hope because of a personal God. We have hope because of a powerful God. And you know that powerful God can change your situation. He doesn't always choose to do it, but he can. But not only that, that power also has the ability to change you. I want to tell you, some of you might find this hard to believe, but you know there was a time that I hardly ever spoke. I see the eyebrows. And now a pastor standing up there like I love to talk. But you know, my first 18 years of life, I talked very little, except possibly to my family. You see, I had a speech impediment and I stuttered. And so when I would try to have a conversation with people, my words just didn't come out. Even in class, teachers didn't call on me because they didn't want to embarrass me and didn't want to make it awkward for other students. They thought they were doing me a favor, but quite often it just got me to feel more left out. But then as I, I came to understand, I had, had some great, just a few really great close friends and my family that supported me and helped me to realize that my identity was not in my impediment, that I was more than that. And so I went to college, and as I went to college, I prayed to God, and I said, God, I'm tired of it. I'm going. I was excited about going to college. I said, I'm going to go.
go, and you know what, God, I want to talk. And if if I stutter, they're just going to have to listen. And it's okay if they're a little bit comfortable with, uncomfortable with it. So I was determined I was going to do that. And I go and, and I, I pray. I, I really had conversations with God about this because I, I was a little bit nervous. I didn't know how all this was going to turn out. I was at college for the first two or three weeks. And one of the girls that graduated from high school with me, her name was Emily. She came up to me and she said, Greg, you're not stuttering anymore. I said, I know, ain't it great? <laughs> <laughs> there's a whole lot of explanation that can go into that. I, I think there's something about, about me changing location, but more than that, I think God was a part of what happened in the midst of that. I think it was me being willing to understand that I was more than what other people at times may try to define me to be. And I want you to understand, particularly for you who are graduates, there may be something about you, there may be something in your past, there may be something in your character, there may be something in your appearance that you are allowing to hold you back from where God wants you to be. Don't do it anymore. Do not allow yourself to be defined by anything less than who God created you to be. Now, if I had continued to stutter, that wouldn't have made me less of a person. But I needed to, regardless of whether I was stuttering or not, I needed to know that wasn't my identity. That's not to say that whatever you're struggling with is going to completely go away like my stuttering did, but it can be put in its place by God to the point that it no longer is a hindrance to you being who God created you to be. Instead, it becomes an asset. It becomes something God uses to reach other people, to show them hope, to show them purpose, because of who you're able to be in the midst of that. So God, we're able to have hope because of the power of God. How about the promise of God? Isaiah Chapter 43, verse 2, talks about the promise that we have of God for today. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. Flames will not set you ablaze. Now, graduates, that doesn't mean I want you to go set a fire and try to walk through it today. That's not what this is talking about. You're going to have enough challenges come your way soon enough. If you don't believe me, ask the adults sitting around. It's going to happen. But scripture says right here, this is what it's talking about, that when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. It doesn't say that the seas are always going to be parted like it did for Moses. Maybe it will. Maybe that changes the situation. But if that doesn't change at that point in time, you can know 100% for sure that God, the one that is all-powerful and all-knowing and knows everything about you and has the ability to accomplish anything he desires is there with you. But it doesn't stop there. There's also hope for tomorrow. John 16, verse 33 says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. Not you might, but you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. We know how the story ends. That gives us even more hope. So, hope makes a difference. Hope is an anchor. It makes a difference in what we think. Without hope, we think that we're living for what we see today. We think we're living for success, for money, for houses, for family, for health, for sports teams, etc. When those things seem to be going well, we can feel good and positive about life. When they aren't going well, we can easily lose hope. But this type of hope, confident hope, through God and our Lord Jesus Christ that we're talking about today, keeps us looking ahead, knowing what is to come. Hope knows that evil may have its day, but God has the final say. So it makes a difference in what we think. It also makes a difference in how we act when we have hope. The hope that is to be a part of who he is, who we are. Psalm chapter 146. Graduates, I told you all this is in the Bible. 
Psalm 46, verses 3 through 5, do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On, on that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. No matter what happens in this life, we can be joyful because our hope isn't in people, plans, or prosperity of this world, but in God alone. And we can deal with the hardships and sufferings of life knowing that temporary problems won't affect the final outcome of our life. Nothing can change the person, power, or promise of God. So, hope not only makes a difference in how we act, it makes a difference just in who we are. Psalm chapter 31, verse 24 says, Be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. That's the NIV. I like the way the King James says it as well. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, and ye that hope in the Lord. All ye that hope in the Lord. Because of our hope is anchored in who God is, we can be strong and courageous in the midst of the storm. Though the world shakes around us, we remain unshakable. People, hope is our anchor. And we have it. It's who we are. Do you understand that? It's not just something that's temporary. It's not just something that's situational. It's who we are as people of God. Hope as an anchor keeps us from being tossed to and fro. Graduates, you're about to embark. You're going to go to new places. You're going to be around new people. And I can tell you this, and, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but when I went to college, I remember my freshman year, just a few years ago. Um, I go, and, and there's this, this place, this gathering <clears throat> place for all of the freshmen when they first come in. And there are these clubs. There are these groups, and they're jockeying to get you to sign up on their team, on their group, to be a part of what they've got going on. And it makes you feel really good. You want to be, you're, somebody wants you to, but you know what? I realized pretty quickly, you can sign up for all those things, and all of a sudden, you don't have any time of your own anymore. So we need to be careful in the choices we make. And I believe you need to go. There's places you need to connect, and there's people you need to connect with. But let me challenge you in this way. Instead of simply going to the place that feels good, going to the place that maybe offers you the most, allow God to be a part of directing and guiding and leading that. And you know, if you have the problem that I had, maybe part of that problem is allowing God to help you use a two-letter word. No. Because there's times I, I wanted so much to be a part of everything, I kept saying, yes, yes, yes. And before long, I was trying to, and I just got run out. That can happen. Sometimes God leads us to say no, and it's not because it's a bad thing. It's just because he doesn't want us to be involved in that at that point in time. No can be a good word. Not only does it keep us from being tossed to and fro, when you have hope, you're able to give it to others. Because when they're being tossed to and fro and they see something that's stable, they see something that's not moving, and they're in the midst of a storm and just want stability, guess who they'll reach out to? What we need to realize is they're not really reaching out to us, they're reaching out to the God, who is a personal God, who is a powerful God, and who makes promises that he's not always just always going to be not just with us, but with anyone who desires to reach out to them. That's what they're reaching for, even if they don't know. So yes, we are to be hope. Let me tell you what God does. We're not done yet, so don't get excited. We still have got a few more minutes. I'm coming there because I need to show you something. Today we're talking about hope. And many of you know Joseph Barotska. Joseph has been and spoken to our women's group, has spoken to our men's group, been here and, and spoken here to the church a time or two. And he called me after we had the, um, the breakfast, the men's prayer breakfast that we had 
this past Friday. He said, you know, Greg, I think that I might be coming and, and the new assistant chaplain that's going to be coming, he may be able to come. We may be able to be there on Sunday. I said, that'd be great, Joseph. Love to have you come. I didn't tell him what the topic was today. But one of the things besides introducing fans you're going to hear in a minute, you need to know that because our church has, is a partner with Joseph and is a partner with Charles Will Albemarle Jail. And so we, we commit to staying connected and we need to know that. So I wanted to do that. But more than that, Joe is, Joseph has another ministry. And all I'm going to say is that the name of this ministry is Hope is Everything. Joseph didn't know what today's message was. I didn't ask Joseph to come. He just said, if you want me to, I think I can come and maybe introduce fans. So I think God's probably got something up his sleeve, don't you think? Come on, Joseph. fantastic to be here. Most of you don't know I come here on Fridays once in a while for food. Greg mentioned something about not anyone making a mistake. I think Greg made it clear today. The first thing had to be Mike on the stage. Two, he allowed me to bring a guest. Another mistake. And the third one is we both have Italian blood so it's going to take a while. So stay in black. I am chatting at Admiral Shaw for Regional Jail. And some of the things I see in there, I won't go into great detail, but I can tell you this. Hope is everything. Because there isn't. There are times, even recently, an 18 year old girl comes in, drug related, we reach her inside, she gets baptized, she gets out, she gets shot. 22 year old girl comes in, thinks her life is over, she gets one phone call, tries to pour it around her neck, she tries to kill herself. No hope. Nothing but despair. That's why hope is there. We have this opportunity every day to go in there and provide hope to those who think there is none. Because the enemy wants them to think there is none. But there's nothing left. They worry. No one's thinking about them. Nobody wants them. And we did it. The range is from DUI to murder. 18 to 80. When I first got there, there were 502 inmates in a facility built for 350, plus 160 staff. And me. I said, Lord, you got to be kidding. I'm going to do this. There's no way. But I did. And he put me there because he opened the doors. But after two years, People started going to the chat. You're looking rough, man. Every day I hear this, you're looking rough. In my committee, I have a staff, they're all older than me. When older people start coming, you're looking rough. <laughs> <laughs> you're looking rough. So I'm like, what do you want to do? I said, you need help. You need help in that battle that you're in every day. You're in enemy territory every day. I said, okay. Let's pray about it. So we start praying about it. And I start telling people we're looking for an assistant. We tell people we're looking for help. We tell people, please pray for something to come. That God would show up with somebody, somewhere, somehow. But until then, I'm going to keep pushing. A year, we pray. People were praying for a year. And then I get a phone call. Go. It's good news. You don't the news. You're boss. We got a guy. <laughs> I didn't tell him I was praying for anybody. He said, what do you mean you got a guy? When someone says you got a guy, you got a guy. You know, from where I grew up, it's means something good. We got this guy. We're trying to pray. But you know, doors are open. Are you kidding me? He said, no, I want you to meet this guy. So I did. We zoomed. We talked. And we brought him in. We got him approved. But it wasn't that easy. But God opened the door. And we brought this guy in named Richard Van Armstrong. Gentleman sitting right here, and you come here in a minute and tell you a little bit about the story. About how God 
God moves in people's lives. Because God cannot be contained outside the walls of jail. I'll tell you that. He don't move every day. And then to the pump and show us about this story. Richard Van Armstrong. Good guy.
And we just look forward to meeting each of you in the days to come. And I'll leave you with this verse in Hebrews 10, 23, which says, Let us hold firmly to the hope that we claim to have. For the one who promised, God the Father, the one who promised, is faithful. And may God bless you all. God is good. Amen. 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 Not only did God send Dan to me, but I also have a female assistant chaplain. It has nothing to do with good news. She's more my age. She decided to go back to seminary for doing a full career nursing. And she called me. Somehow she got my name. She just wanted to know a little bit about chaplain. See, she's going to be a hospital chaplain. After four weeks of discussing, I finally got her inside. I can't get her out of the jail. <laughs> she's administering to the female. She's the one that everyone needs. So not only God provides Dan, but God always does in that side. It's not just at the top and keep going strong and all the time. In the midst of all of this, in the midst of all of this, I kept hearing stories from parents inside of the jail. I had witnessed a baby having been taken away from a mom. She was an inmate, gave birth, she had to go back to jail with no family. So what happens to the infant? Child, the child. Social service protective custody. I'm thinking, there's something wrong here. And then I hear more and more stories inside of these women losing their children to the state or to whoever, the foster care. And God puts on my heart that maybe I need to be doing something about that. And again, I said, You're kidding. How in the world am I going to think about this? I've got so much going on in here. But he said, This is what I need you to do. So like the concept kept, came in my head. What is the one thing I hear inside? I was Despair and hopelessness, and that's when I came up with the same You need to put the children outside. Who's, who's doing it for them? I don't have a son in my car. I don't even have a father in my car. I didn't even know what a chaplain was, and I'm a child. And I, I go to a church and see a friend of mine. He's not there. There's a guy working at the desk. I give him my car. I said, Tell him I stopped by. He said, Great. The next day, that guy at the desk called. 15 seconds I knew this man. Now, if that, I don't even know his name. He said, I had a vision about you last night. I said, what? Someone starts telling that boy. He said, I want to think of lunch, too. I'm like, oh, here we go. <laughs> what's this about, right? You always wonder what's going on. And he tells me, I was praying, I was dreaming, and God told me, that guy you met yesterday, you need to go support him with your hand. So bring me to lunch. He knows nothing about what's going on in my head. Zero. Sits me down and he tells me that God said, I need to support you. You start getting ready to start something new. I said, You're kidding. He said, No. He said, I am supposed to be, I'm supposed to fund you. What do you say? And he did. I came out of the all the fees, all that. I told him what was going on in my head. My jaw's down the ground, his jaw's down the ground, and he does. He supports you. And he becomes now powerful. Okay, that's great. So what we're going to do? Well, I call social services. What do you need? You need duffel bags. Because the kids are walking around the house with clothes and garbage bags. That's what we need. We need dogs. We need to hide them. We need Great. We started a non-profit on his money. Lo and behold, guy invites me out to lunch. I don't tell him a lot about what I'm doing. I said, man, get ready to start this non-profit. That's what we're doing. Sits me down, buys me lunch. He goes, I'd like to be part of it. He said, uh, I'd like to give you some money. I said, great. I'd like to check for $10,000 at lunch. Oh, I'm yeah. stuck. Can we raise close to $30,000? I haven't got anything. But God has. Mm -hmm. And that's the point. He's moving. And if anyone who watches the Chronicles of Narnia, Aslan is on the move. And it's our job as a body to see where he's moving and go that direction. Because he will provide. Always. I see kids in jail all the time. College students who are not in jail. Teachers, professors, doctors, lawyers. Every A to Z. Feel like their life's over. And as Greg was saying earlier, it's not. Hope is always there. There's a passage that I, I love to read. I sign Bibles, believe it or not. Don't ask me how, but I do. It's come on the radio a lot. Or sometimes on television promoting the ministry of what's going on in the jail. I'm a liaison between community and jail. And inmates actually hear me on the radio. They're, they're 
practice it. He's one guy who said, hey, we signed a Bible, we went to church. He said, next thing you know, people are wanting to sign Bibles. So I thought, okay, I'll start doing that, put them in the bags, so they're discharged and give them in the bags. And I put verses in them. This is one of them. So I was at the night. Chapter 3, I'm going to start with uh, verse 15. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hand pain the wound. That's that discouragement. When you feel like it's over, you're done. The shoulder's strong. The Lord, your God, is with you. The mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you. My favorite verse. But rejoice over your sin. How powerful is that? The God of heaven. God of everything will sing rejoice over you. When you graduate, so when you hit that moment, when you will hit that moment, remember that. The God of heaven sings you. to come forward, it will be a time of invitation. We have speakers come every once in a while, and I, I invite them, I encourage them to come and allow us to be a part of what they're doing, and all too often, not too often, at a lot of times, and it's a good thing, it's what we're asking for, they come and I ask them to tell us their need, so we can support them, so we can be a part of it. It's powerful to me when Joseph comes and says he was starting this nonprofit that he wasn't too sure about starting, but he wasn't sure he had time to do it anyway. And then God says to do it, and instead of him coming and asking us for money to be able to start it, he says, God already gave me $30,000. I think it's something I should probably be doing. And he's basically saying, do you want to come alongside me? Not because he has to have us in order for it to keep going. He's, he's got God on his side and he's $30,000 to the good right now. But what he's given us is an opportunity. There's a double back. He's given me a list and I want you to know this. It's not just about Charlottesville. He's been and visited social services here in Nelson County. Nelson County gave him a list of what they would like to go into the duffel bags to give to people that are involved in the system here that would be most helpful. This bag is filled with that stuff. This is our first bag. And Joe, if he chooses to, can take it with him today and pack it on to wherever it needs to go. That list is going to be put in our newsletter. It will be listed at different places in the church. If you want to be a part of it, you can. And remember what it said, following God where he's going, this is one of the places God's going. And we can be a part of that if we choose to be. But when there's hope involved, there are so many places that there needs to be hope. And we need to be willing to share it. So listen to where God is at work and go there and be willing to be hope. Not from who we are, but from who God is. Let's stand together and sing. Respond as God would lead. I'll be here. I'm happy to pray with you. If you have any decisions, if you don't know that hope because you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'd love to talk to you about that today. Maybe you want to be a part of a, of a church family in a way that you feel like Woodland is a place that God's leading you to to connect in a, in a very special, unique way here. We'd love to talk to you about that and let you know what it means to be a part of the membership here. But regardless, there is something God's saying to you today. Hear what God's saying and respond as we leave. Let's sing together. Come as you are.
know we have small groups that meet right after this time. And we do that kind of on purpose as an opportunity. We have facilitators who do more teaching and going into the Word. Today it will be about hope and about what hope is, but it's also an opportunity to hear stories and to get practical application as to what that looks like for us in our everyday life. So I encourage you. There's two adult classes. We kind of split them up so they can be small and people have opportunity to discuss. There's a youth class, and we also have someone that meets with our children. So there's something for everyone. If you're new and you're not sure exactly where to go, find me, find someone else, and we'll be glad to help you know where that will be. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of the hope that God desires the world to be able to see because of who he is. God, we do thank you again for this opportunity we have to come and serve you, to worship you. And Lord, in the midst of that, we know that there's hope. <coughs> We know there's hope no matter how bad things may look. And Lord, we know that that hope carries over to those who don't think there is any hope, to those who feel so hopeless, but help us have the ability, not of our own, but because of who you are, to show them that hope. Help us to give, help give us the words, the actions, to, to just be who you called us to be, not someone that you don't want us to be. And in the midst of that, show yourself to those who need hope. And in the midst of that, Lord, we continue to grow in our hopefulness as well. This prayer we, we pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Oh, my God. 